That's part of what tradition is supposed to teach you by presenting you with examples of great people of the past. The lesson is not supposed to be exactly bow down and worship these people. Mm -hmm. It's be like them, be like them. And you could be. And I mean, that's really the goal of the humanities when it's the humanities. If it's not, if that's the goal, then students will study the humanities. As soon as that ceases to be the goal, then it, it, there's, there's nothing of value there. I mean, great literature tells you, it tells you the great story of good and evil, always. It's good and evil against a background of chaos and order, always. And the evil characters are there to, to, to be bad examples and the good characters are there to be good examples. Or you see the interplay of those forces within a single person. And, 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 and it's a reminder of, of who you could be. And you, you can find out who you should be. It's actually, this, and this is something quite mysterious, I believe. And, and part of the proof, let's say, that we exist in a world of value. Your conscience tells you who you should be. Now, that doesn't mean that necessarily that it's infallible, but people wrestle with their conscience. You know, there isn't anyone, I've never met anyone who is, you know, a, I'm not, I'm narcissists accepted, yeah, let's say. Yeah. People are generally tormented by their conscience. And the reason for that is that they're not, they're deviating from the path that is their destiny. I mean, and if you don't think that, well, then what do you think? What do you think that conscience is? I mean, I've asked my classes repeatedly, do you have a little voice in your head that tells you when you've done something wrong or you're about to or a feeling? And they all, they all immediately agree with that. No one finds that a foreign concept. And so if you don't know who you are, your conscience will remind you when you're not, or sorry, if you don't know who you could be, your conscience will remind you when you deviate. And then you can start to attend to that. Think, well, look, I'm actually ashamed when I do mm -hmm. this. I should stop. Unless I want to be ashamed all the time, it looks like I should stop. And then maybe you stop doing that and, and then your conscience objects to something else and maybe you stop doing that. And as that happens, you start to develop a vision of who you could be. And the chapter indicates it, 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 uh, it looks at symbolic representations it's an examination of a certain symbolic representation of the ideal. And so it's my attempt to um, assess tradition for what it can tell us about what the ideal human being might be like. And the ideal human being is the person who forthrightly upholds the traditions of the culture and forges a way into the unknown. We, we went through that and, um, and pulls new information in and builds, rebuilds himself and the world for you to make contact with the highest of values, you have to bring that down to your particulars and figure out how you do that. It's gonna be a way that no one else does it because you're the only one that's you. And, but you can, you can aim at something, aim at something. And the, the, the point of the chapter is that you aim at something and that will shape you as you move towards it. And then your aim will change, you'll move, but that doesn't matter. It gets you going. And you'll be molded across time more and more into the person you could be. When you're doing it right, what does it feel like? Well, to begin with, and this happened when I was in graduate school, I had a lot of bad habits. I smoked like a pack of cigarettes a day and I drank a lot. I, I came from this little town in Northern Alberta and like many little towns, especially in Northern Canada, the alcohol overuse is de rigor, you know, it's, it's, and so um, I noticed when I was in my early 20s that the only time I really regretted what I had done was when I was drinking. Now, it was also interfering with me writing because I couldn't concentrate well enough if I was hungover, but I also couldn't really concentrate, I couldn't. I couldn't tolerate the emotional strain of what I was writing about when I was hungover. It was too, I couldn't handle being on the edge because I destabilized my nervous system. In any case, I stopped drinking. And the reason for that was, well, I decided I didn't want to be ashamed of what I was doing anymore. It seemed, I thought, well, maybe I could not do things that were shameful and then see what my life was like. So that, that was sort of on the negative end, the constraint end. 
Um, I think people get on the more positive end, people get deeply involved in what they're doing if they're in the right place in the right time. So that you, I would say you can tell this is the idea of heaven on earth to some degree. When time stops, when you're not aware of the duration of time, when you're so engaged with what you're doing that you're not aware of the duration of time, then then you've got the forces of chaos balance and order balanced properly. It's, you're not stultified and bored. That's an excess of order. Everything's too predictable. You're not overwhelmed. You're you're dealing with. It's like it's like it's you're playing tennis at the peak of your game. That's partly what people experience when they're great athletes when they play. The zone, yeah. You know, and they're always stretching themselves to their limit. You can tell that if you watch a gymnast, for example, who who has a brilliant performance, they've stretched themselves beyond their domain of competence during the performance. And that's what makes everybody leap to their feet. That's that's the incarnation given embodiment right there in front of you for some moments. And everyone cheers that on. That it becomes fleeting in that suddenly you could have a great month and then suddenly something happens, chaos returns. Like it's it's that we almost forget that moment. You can't like you can't hold it. Well, it requires a lot of it requires even to some degree some good fortune to maintain. I certainly haven't been able to do that while I was ill. You know, and time one of the consequences of of my illness, whatever it was or is, was time dilation. Like days lasted weeks, it seemed like minutes lasted hours, and I mean that literally. Um, and that was terrible. The weight of time, it's the weight of brute mortality. It's the weight of self-consciousness. And you escape that immersed properly. So, and that, that second chapter is a pretty practical chapter. It's like, well, if you're not who you want to be, then think about how you could be better. Take a chance, aim at that, work at it, and see what happens. One of the things I tell young people all the time I'm not a very typical psychologist in this regard because psychologists like to pat people on the head and say, you're all right the way you are. I talked to Bishop Barron a while ago. I'm, I'm going to broadcast this. And he said that the Catholic priests were trained in the 1960s to kind of be accepting, you know, humanistically. Mm -hmm. You're okay the way you are, you know. And that's such rubbish. It's like, <laughs> not only are you not okay the way you are, you don't think that anybody else is okay the way they are either. And you're not, you don't think your children are okay the way they are, like you love them and all that, but you don't want them to stay three years old their entire life. You want them to expand and improve and become who they are. And so, instead of telling young people that they're okay the way they are, I tell them that, and it's a terrible message for them if they're desperate. You know, so let's say 10% of the people in my audience are young, maybe they're young men just for the sake of argument. And they're like not in good shape. goals they're they're drinking too much they're watching pornography all the time they've got no aim they've got no structure in their life and they're just <coughs> bloody miserable and the misery is twisting them into malevolence because enough misery will absolutely do that to you and then what are you going to do and come along and say well you're you're okay the way you are it's like that's the last <coughs> thing they want to hear it's like get your damn act <coughs> together you know, you got things to do, and they're going to be difficult. And that there, there's a there's a there's a, an echoing Christian message in there, I would say, which is, you pick up the weight of your suffering voluntarily, and you walk uphill with it. And that not only gives you the meaning that you need in in your life to stop you from degenerating 
in a dangerous manner, but it actually makes things better. And so that, that, that all has to be part of it. Like I believe in human ingenuity. I think we can solve all the problems that beset us, but it can't just be, it has to be more than we can enhance material well-being, which is what it tends to be now. It's not enough. And so, and you get brushed off by the apocalyptic types. You know, I've been an advocate for people to put their lives together. And of course, my life has fallen apart. And so you might ask yourself, well, are you aware of the irony of that? And the answer to that is, well, absolutely. You know, it's shameful. Um, I feel that frequently. And then so you might say, and people tweet this out fairly regularly, you know, uh, uh, who am I to give advice? And I, I suppose that's a perfectly relevant question. I guess I've always thought, and I said this too in the lectures during the tour, that I don't really think that what I'm doing is giving mm -hmm. advice, or if I am, I'm also giving it mm -hmm. to me. You know, it's not like I believe that I have all the answers. I have answers that I've found useful while attempting to move ahead. And with this new book, I can show you this. That's yeah. what it looks like the black counterpart to the white book, the previous book. Out today. You know, I, I wrote a lot of it while I was extremely ill. And there were some advantages to that, I think, in that I only kept that material. felt was reliable under duress. Now, I think probably, perhaps, my creativity was somewhat compromised, and so that may have impacted the book negatively, but it made for more severe editing. For example, the last chapter is, uh, be grateful in spite of your suffering, and certainly maintaining that gratitude is something I've struggled with. I think anybody who's in pain chronically struggles with resentment, mm -hmm. but I know that resentment poisons. And I think that Gorm of courage. And so I stand by what I've written.